You're listening to the Whole Hog Football Podcast, sponsored by Bud Anderson Home Services. Every Monday through Friday during the Razorbacks Football Training Camp, bringing you the latest news, position analysis, and more. Here's your hosts, Matt Jones and Scotty Bordelon. Arkansas went through its final practice before scrimmage number two on Friday morning. It was a shorter practice. Razorback's taking things a little bit easier in preparation for that scrimmage on Saturday. Matt Jones joined by Tom Murphy of the Arkansas Democrat Gazette and Scotty Bordelon of WholeHogSports.com. Scotty and Tom, you were at the practice field earlier today. What were some of the takeaways that you saw this morning? Um, let's see. Yeah, things were a little bit lighter. Traylon Smith still not there, but expected back pretty soon. I don't think he would scrimmage even if he was fully ready to go. So we're going to I think we're going to get a pretty big dose of Rocket Sanders as the lead running back tomorrow in the scrimmage with a dose of A.J. Green, who uh, is back out of the green no-contact jersey. So um, I hope that they can keep their running backs healthy so there's a full complement of those guys when the season hits because, honestly, just about every one of them has had some kind of ding up in this camp, and there's been one scrimmage. They had a a big, heavy hitting deal yesterday Barry Odom said and it looks to me like they came out of it okay based on the numbers and the guys we saw out there but um, they're going to hold some guys out of tomorrow's scrimmage and KJ said they were going to try to throw down field a little bit more and so that was one of my key takeaways Scotty. Yeah for sure like Tom said it was a pretty light day I think our the time that we got to stay in there I think it was shortened a little bit which which is fine it was about 15 minutes um, one of my takeaways <laughs> from this is not really player related, but Kenny Guyton still got a a quarterback arm on him. Um, The quarterbacks were down toward the, um, toward one end of the field, uh, you know, finishing up some, some warm up drills with Kendall Browse and the receivers were on the far end. And while the receivers were waiting on the quarterbacks to get done, Kenny Guyton was slinging it around. He he still got a pretty good arm on him. I think Um, as far as like the fastball starts and stuff, I think Harper Cole had a pretty good play. I think he took a pitch, I think it was from Lucas Coley with the threes, and he made a really nice cut upfield that would have turned into a maybe a 10 or 15 yard gain, maybe even more than that. And who was the other Tom? I can't I can't remember what the other play that I saw. Oh, John David White had a catch against Hudson Clark. I think that was the only other real play that that stood out. The third team defense for the second straight day in those fastball starts went with a four down front again. Uh, and those that four was Jashad Stewart, Eric Gregory, Torian Carter, and Mateo Soli. So I'm kind of curious, you know, with that third group, if there's, you know, a little bit of competition for, you know, some some added playing time maybe between Jashad Stewart and, and a guy like Mateo Soli, who we really haven't just heard a whole lot of uh, in this camp. Yeah, I, I would say that the offense had a better day during the fastball starts than they did on – Wednesday when they really, they had a bad day. They didn't move the ball much at all. But, uh, you know, Rocket Sanders had a good run today. And um, I'm pretty sure uh, I want to remember say, a couple of check down passes. Yeah. And, and you know, Malik Hornsby has been up and down. And today was an up day for Malik Hornsby. Would you say that's been the case, Tom, with all the quarterbacks to this point uh, in, in the preseason that they've been up and down? It, it seems like from what I've heard from you guys and and others who have been out there, that there really hasn't been a lot of consistency from one day to the next from any of the quarterbacks. I think that's a fair assessment. I I think that the defensive front, there's so much competition for playing time. Everybody wants to impress and they're playing more aggressively. They're getting up field quicker. I just think that there's been a lot of uh, penetration and KJ and the other quarterbacks are having to make quick decisions now, the fact that they're having to do that in camp is hopefully going to prepare them for, for the games, and maybe things won't be quite as quick against Rice. But that's what quarterbacks have to do. They have to know what the call is. They have to know what all the checks and var- variations on the play are and make very quick decisions. And, um, and KJ is going to be under, under the gun. Today, Kendall Bryles put a number up for him, 65% completions he'd like to see. I don't think they're going to be able to get that high, but if they can get to 60 – I think they'll be have, have a pretty good offensive season. We look at the scrimmage tomorrow. What are you looking for? And, and I know it's close to the media and close to the public. So this everything that we're going to learn about the scrimmage is going to be 
through the interviews with coaches and players and, and maybe uh, some other things that, that leak out of the scrimmage, like Hunter Juracek getting hit across the face with a cleat last week. Um, but, but as you look at the scrimmage tomorrow, what do you think the coaches are wanting to get out of it? What do you expect you'll see out of it? Scotty, let's start with you. Yeah, I think they want to get out of it healthy. I don't know that they can, you know, afford to to lose guys two weeks out from the from the from the first game of the year. But the thing that I'm going to be listening for is were were you cleaner on both sides of the ball in terms of penalties? I think that was that was one of the big things that Sam Pittman was just not real happy about after the first scrimmage. Too many defensive pass interference penalties. And I know those guys in the secondary get awful aggressive um, and handsy. And um, I guess that, that you want your DBs to be aggressive, but not, you know, kind of toe the line maybe a little bit. Um, and then just on special teams too, like I know that the, they brought SEC officials out for that first scrimmage. And so that's kind of getting these guys accustomed to what they're going to see in a game. But penalties are a big deal just on both sides of the ball. Don't, you know, you can't set yourself back as an offense with with false starts and as a defense, you know, jumping off sides, you can't give away five free yards. And on special teams, too, like I remember last year, it seems like Arkansas had an illegal procedure penalty just about every time they punted. Like it was it was kind of rare if, if Arkansas's punt team hit the field and there wasn't a penalty flag thrown. So that's that kind of stuff's got to get cleaned up like a special teams is going to be better. You know, you can't you can't afford to you know, give up five yards here and there. That's got to be a lot cleaner. Absolutely, yeah. Special teams has got to make a major move this season, and that starts with, you know, tomorrow, having a better scrimmage than they did. I understand there was some organizational stuff going on in the first one that delayed some of the snaps on on special teams work. So that's got to be better. Uh, KJ said they were going to try the deep ball tomorrow. I mean, he, he, he pointed that out specifically. So do they have any success? Are they throwing to Keytron Jackson with the ones? You know, are, I would think that Traylon Burks, Trey Knox, and maybe Devion Warren get minimal, if any, playing time tomorrow. Same with Traylon Smith, same with Grant Morgan. And you could probably name several guys on defense. So uh, do they have any kind of running game at all? Rocket Sanders is probably going to get a few looks. I would not give him very many carries. I mean, if he's going to be your number two back, I hate to sound, you know, like uh, overly concerned, but the fewer hits your running backs take, the better. And communication on the offensive front in terms of picking up blitzes and getting pass protection right. I think that was an issue in scrimmage one. As I mentioned yesterday, it's rare that we get to hear from coordinators now since Sam Pittman became the head coach. Uh, he's changed the media policies in, in terms of, of who is available. Uh, you, you hear from players still quite a bit, but as far as assistant coaches and coordinators, uh, the availability has has shrunk up a lot compared to you know, previous coaches at Arkansas. And so when you get to hear the coordinators, I said this yesterday, I think it's a treat. You, you get to learn a lot about their units and Barry Odom being a safeties coach and, and Kendall Browse being a quarterback's coach. You also get to hear about those players in the indiv individual position rooms that they coach. And so Kendall Bryles spoke with media this morning and here were some highlights from what he had to say. Yeah. Offensively, uh, I feel like we're right where we need to be at camp. Um, obviously, there's always room to improve. Had a good practice. Just got the practice field right now. Um, the main thing that you want is, is guys learning and then retaining. And uh, I feel like we're doing that offensively at all positions um, and then staying healthy. That's, that's what camp's all about. And, um, you know, these guys already know us. We've been here, so they know what to expect. We've got a couple new coaches, but I feel like we're right where we need to be. Coach, how's the uh, backup quarterback job uh, going? Uh, it looks like Malik's been pretty steady there, um, but really it looks like maybe there's a little more competition for that third spot. Yeah, you're right there. You know, KJ's one, Malik is two right now. He's he's had all the two reps, and, you know, he hadn't let that go. Uh, Malik's a special athlete, and, you know, he puts pressure on KJ, and that's what we want. Um, you know, the third spot, we've got, you know, three guys that are really handling that with, with Jones, Renfro, and Coley. Um, all those guys are getting reps. Um, and they're all different. You know, there's, there's different abilities that, you know, the tough thing with ball camp is, you know, unlike the spring in the spring, you can throw a bunch of guys out there with a bunch of reps, you know, right now we're getting ready to beat rice. So, um, they're limited in, in, you know, the opportunities that they have on the field. So they got to make the most of them, um, which is a lot of times it's hard, you know, to be able to get in rhythm and be on the field and really get lathered up. So it's difficult. We understand that, but all three of those guys are still competing. 
pretty rare thing to have as many starters back as you do, but then replace your quarterback. How does that uh, how does that help you going into the season, having so much experience back, particularly the line? Yeah, and now that's what I was going to say. You know, up front having that experience back, it's just huge. Uh, you know, we had a had a no line change with Coach Kennedy, and uh, he was here in the spring and knows you know obviously our expectations and how he's going to coach those guys. So he's done a tremendous job with them, and I think they've really. Um, you know, like the change with, with Coach Kennedy. You know, I feel like that room's in a great spot right now. But we do. We've got a lot of returning guys. You know, obviously when you lose a guy like Felipe and, um, you know, you're going to feel that. And, you know, that's it was great that we had a spring without him and, and get those quarterbacks out there. And those guys are all all chomping at the bit and they're all ready to contribute. Um, but I feel like we we got a host of guys that are uh, very capable and um, we just got to continue to work this this fall camp. Tom, as you listened to Kendall Bryles this morning, what stood out to you? Um, let's see. Uh, that that KJ is on course. That KJ uh, that he that KJ knows that Kendall would like to see him around two thirty five. He's now under two forty five, but still looking pretty agile. Still has a good first step. And as Kendall said, KJ could weigh two hundred and eighty five as long as he's dropping dimes on people and getting away in the pass rush. So um, we didn't get into specifics about, well, he said that the the protection issues they faced in the first scrimmage were more younger guys. So I, I'm hoping that means that the veteran guys did what they were supposed to do in pass pro because we've just seen defensive linemen getting loose and getting early pressure on KJ so often in our limited uh, viewings. Let's see that Keetron Jackson's having a superb camp. Uh, Rocket Sanders is too. And um, the Traylon would be at the scrimmage and maybe, maybe wouldn't be doing much, but hopefully we see him back next week. Scotty, I know you're writing on Keetron Jackson today. I thought it was interesting that Kendall said that he was quote by far the most improved player on the offense. Yeah. He's a, he's a guy that I think can contribute right away. And I think if you're looking at freshmen on the offensive side of the ball, maybe aside from Rocket Sanders, he's a guy that maybe has as high of expectations on him as, as any. And he's good. He's got a good frame. I think he's added quite a bit of weight. I know I was looking uh, at Arkansas's recruiting rankings. He was the highest rated guy in Arkansas's last class. And I think then uh, coming out of high school, he was like 6'2", 186, and now he's 6'2", 205. So he's, he's got a pretty good frame on him, kind of rangy guy. And KJ Jefferson said that he likes the explosiveness that Keytron's been playing with in, in this camp. And he's a guy that, you know, maybe can help fill a little bit of the void that Mike Woods left in terms of being able to, you know, quick one, two, get by your get by your your man defender and, and take the top off of a defense. And one of the things I think it was really big that he went through the spring. And, you know, he was he was able I think that really benefited him because he was one able to get kind of a head start on maybe some of these other guys at receiver in terms of learning the offense, the concepts, the ins and outs of that. And then growing more comfortable with that knee because he was you know wearing a knee brace all throughout the spring. And now he's got it off. And I think he's moving more fluid and I think he's a lot more confident. And I think he's right now he's right in the heart of, of Arkansas's receivers rotation. I'm, I, that's a guy that I'm really excited about. We talked a, a week or so ago about the running backs coming in from Oklahoma and the, the competition that they faced in high school. Same thing with Keetron Jackson coming in from uh, not the largest classification in Texas, but one of the larger uh, classifications in Texas. And, and obviously, he saw a lot of uh, really good competition there. Tom, one more thing from Kendall Bryles uh, that, that I wanted to touch on, and that's that he was asked about Landon Rogers and his move to tight end from quarterback. He said that if he puts on another 10 to 15 pounds, he would be at an ideal uh, weight for a tight end. Do you see this being a permanent move for Landon Rogers, or do you just see this being kind of a stopgap measure while they're low on tight ends this year? Yeah, really hard to stay on that. But if he does put on 15 pounds, uh, I guess that would uh, assist him as a being a larger quarterback. But, I mean, K.J. Jefferson's a redshirt sophomore. It, it depends on how quickly Landon Rogers – in his mind wants to get on the field. And if he develops very quickly as a tight end, that could be a quick way to the field. That could be a get on the field this year kind of situation for Landon. So uh, it depends on where he feels like he'll slot in because Lucas Coley's in the same class as him. 
So tough, tough decision. Uh, but you just, uh, you know, want, want the best for the kid. There were some thought during the recruiting process and over the off season that Landon would eventually wind up as a tight end. So maybe, uh, an early move there would be beneficial to him. The whole log football podcast is brought to you by Bud Anderson home services every day this week. And last we have uh, gone through the different positions on the Razorbanks football team. Today's the end. Today's the final position we haven't talked about, and that's safeties. Tom, this is a, a position where it's it's like a lot of other positions it feels like on the football team. Uh, there's a lot of uh, experience in the back end. Now it's all about you know putting it together and, and becoming a, a really strong group, but the, the SEC experience is there. It absolutely is. This is, a, this is a group that has a chance to be really good. Jalen Catalan, people are grouping him in a, in a category of uh, one of the smartest, one of the uh, quickest to diagnose plays. And Kendall Bryles today said about him that he's a guy who, when he targets you, he just doesn't miss. He comes in and he, and he gets you. And you think about some of the little check down passes Mississippi State threw last year. And if the guy can get four or five yards, they move the chains and Kendall and, and Catalan diagnosed it and went in and took guys out at their feet. He's going to be good. Joe Fouché had a shoulder that that kept him from lifting weights last year, so he should be stronger and and a better hitter. And I think that gives guys like Simeon Blair and, and Malik Chavis, Jaden Johnson, and Miles Slusher, who apparently is going to be a safety slash nickel and could even play corner, just more room to to grow. And and I think they're going to there's going to be some depth there, and it could be a position of strength, Scotty. Yeah, for sure. I think that I think the at safety, you probably feel comfortable going six or seven deep. Like if you throw Miles Slusher in that group, like you feel good about Simeon Blair and Trent Gordon. Jaden Johnson's a young guy, but Joe Fouché and and Simeon were both talking on Thursday about how uh, they kind of compare him to Cam Chancellor, who played, you know, he was part of the Legion of Boom with the Seattle Seahawks. So you got to like what you're hearing about him. And then Jalen Catalan and Malik Chavis. Malik Chavis hasn't you know, maybe got in the pub that, you know, he would like, but that's a, that's another rangy guy that can really run. And I think I've seen some videos that the Twitter Arkansas Twitter account has posted and he's come, come away with some picks. I think he, I know at least we heard from at least one person, maybe Jalen Catalan that during the scrimmage last weekend that Chavis came down with a pick. Uh, so that, that's a pretty good group. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about Joe Fouché because Barry Odom said that he's making as many plays this preseason as anybody on the field. And, you know, if in year two under a defensive coordinator or in a specific scheme, it's not really that uncommon to see guys make a leap. And if Joe Fouché makes a leap, a guy who's already proven that he can be productive like the last two years, I think he's got – I think he's north of 140 tackles and three picks. If he makes another leap, you're talking about Arkansas possibly having – you know, one of the top potentially one-two punches at, at safety that, that the SEC has. Yeah, and I think back to spring, you guys, and there would there'd be times when the backups would be on the field, and Malik Chavis and Jaden Johnson are bigger than so many safeties that they've had over the years, and you're like, dang. And Chavis, Chavis made some plays in the spring as well. So if those guys come along, if they can play fast, you're right, it could be six or seven deep, and – um, and I know that they're going to play more four man fronts, but, uh, there's some good players back there. And, and I think there's so many guys willing to, you know, sacrifice their body to get up and, and make tackles much like Jalen. But I'll say this, I'll caution on Jalen Catalan. He had two targeting calls last year. One of them I strenuously disagreed with in the LSU game. However, that gives you a reputation and sec officials know this. And in the scrimmage the other day, th the tackle that, in which Josh Oglesby hit Hunter Juracek's nose, he was heading out of bounds. And Kalen um, and, and Jalen may have known that, but he hit him. And I, I would say take it easier on your teammates. I know you go 100 miles an hour all the time. I would caution Jalen Catlin. There's a time to dial it back, and that was a time. And, uh, and in games, he's just got to be very wise about the positioning of – where his helmet is and, and making sure he leads with his shoulder and trying to not crush the defenseless quote player. And I go back LSU. That was a bad call. 
when Catalan spoke with us uh, a week or two weeks ago, I think he was asked about the targeting calls and, you know, the, the way he plays. And I think essentially he, he said something to the extent of, I'm going to continue to play the way that I play and just hope that the, uh, you know, the fundamentals that have been in, instilled with me, you know, are, are good enough and, and let the chips fall where they may. But Tom, go, going back to Catalan for a second, Odom said something yesterday to the extent of he thought that, that Jalen Catalan hadn't really gotten to, to where he nearly as good as he thought he could be, you know, that there's still a lot of potential there for him. And I think that's interesting when you think about the fact he was a first team, all SEC uh, safety a year ago, and and you're starting to hear comparisons of him with the types of Atwater and Kenny Hamlin and Kanoe Kennedy, some of the, you know, the really great players to play his position who have come through the program. Absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll answer quick and toss it to Scotty, but I did a feature on Jalen. I can't remember late last season, and it's his film study. It's his leadership. It's his commitment to being a great player and bringing guys along with him. And so I think a lot of the other um, safeties, he's convinced them, go in, study the film. The more you do that, you know, the more you know the tendencies. And, and that's one of the reasons why he's so effective is he can sense what's coming based on film study and why when he zeroes in, he usually hits his target. Yeah, and I hope I hope Jalen doesn't become kind of a marked man for officials, you know, kind of in the same way, you know, if you watch the NBA, you certainly know guys on on rosters like when officials get assigned to a game, they know the guys on the rosters who might give them an attitude problem. So they might have a little bit of a shorter leash. And I just hope Jalen's not entering, you know, that same kind of space in terms of, you know, his physicality and uh, and the and the you know, the potential targeting uh, issues that they could run into there. But, you know, I think Barry Odom thinks that obviously he could be a lot better. And that's just, that's, that's pretty wild because, you know, Jalen had, I think one of the best seasons that we've seen from a safety in a long, long time. And I just hope that he learns, you know, kind of when to turn it on and when to turn it off and be much smarter because he is an invaluable piece in that back end. Um, not that you don't trust guys behind him, but we saw at times last year, you know, when he, when he came out of games there, I mean, there's a, there's a bit of a drop off there just, and that's a credit to how good Jalen is. Uh, You know, he says he's going to play with no regrets. I just hope that he just, I hope he makes wise decisions and he, you know, ultimately doesn't end up regretting, you know, the, the hits that he ends up making. We mentioned that, you know, he's, he's being, talked about in, in the, you know, kind of the same conversation with some of those greats. The big difference is that, you know, Atwater and Kennedy and, and Hamlin, they didn't play in the era of targeting. And this is a, a rule that I really would like to see some modification to. I feel like it is so difficult to make a decision on targeting there in the, you know, the limited time frame that these officials have you know, to really make that call and, and keep the game going and, you know, try not to, you know, have these football games last any longer than they they already do i almost would like to see something and i'd like to get your thoughts from from both of you about this i almost think that this is something that could be handled kind of like basketball does you know with their flagrant one flagrant two you know okay you get a flagrant one but you get another one and and you're tossed out of the game but then i'd also maybe like to see from the sec office maybe a a, a review of these types of targeting calls where Hey, a player had a, a call. He got to play for the rest of the second half. But upon re- you know further review, this was egregious, and he's not going to get to play this next week. Something a little bit maybe more in line with like what the NFL does. Yeah, that, that is a good point. And I'll, I will say that, you know, going back to the NBA again, you know, if there is like – I think the NBA goes back and they review maybe – it's called the, the last two-minute report, and they can rescind or add – I believe, technical fouls or flagrant fouls or something of the like. And I I don't see why, you know, the SEC in the least couldn't adopt something like that because I think if they would have gone back and done further review on that hit that Catalan made against LSU last year, you know, I think they probably would have rescinded it and he would have gotten to play um, in the the game at the beginning of the game the next week. So I I just think that could, you know – I think that could that could obviously be really beneficial. I'm I'm sure Tom's got some some good thoughts on this. <laughs> well, I, I think well, this is obviously an off year for Im- implementing rules only for, for player safety for this year. But yeah, the SEC there'd have to be some impetus behind it from coaches who 
like who if Sam Pittman sent in the LSU and say, what could my guy do any differently than what he did on this play? Because I think the receiver, and I can't remember, it wasn't Racy McMath, it was uh, one of the others, but he caught the ball and he saw Catalan, and I think he ducked his head some. Catalan clearly did not lead with his helmet. He, I think he turned his body, turned his torso to where he kind of hit him with lower shoulder, and it was almost like, I'm doing everything I can to not crush this guy. And it wasn't a crushing shot. And I was really surprised when he was ejected for that. You know, they held it together for the first half of the Missouri game pretty well without Jalen Catalan. Um, but the other one, I think the A&M game might have been a little bit more uh, clear cut. But um, you're right. He's, he's got the he's got to be very careful about getting that, quote, reputation and it's avoiding one in the first half of the season, I think would be really, really wise for Jalen. I think maybe they should implement maybe like a yellow card and a red card. I don't know if that's too <laughs> subjective or not. Uh, um, but even like with basketball too, like with a flagrant one and a flagrant two, like I think if that, that if you use the flagrant, if you use the flagrant foul system, I think that hit against LSU is a yellow and he stays in the game. And that, that game could obviously turn out a lot different. I'd like to see a back judge walk up to Jalen Catalan with a, a red card out of his pocket. <laughs> that, that would be pretty entertaining. I want to go back to one more thing that, that Barry said, Tom, yesterday, and I thought it was interesting about Miles Slusher and his versatility and the ability to go from safety to cornerback. And Barry said that that's, there, there aren't a lot of players who can make that kind of move. Yeah, just a smart, instinctive guy. I think he's right up under Jalen Catalan's wing which means he's going to get in the film study. He cares about him, you know, improving his craft. He got some PT last year and I think he's going to be, I, I don't know if he's going to be the first DB in, but he very well could be. And he, he could get some nickel action as well. What they're doing, they're cross training all these guys. And so if Greg Brooks goes out with a hamstring or something, they can trust that slusher Trent Gordon can go in there and, and the, the, play does not drop off. Uh, we did see Bryce Stevens get by slusher on a uh, run down the middle or on a pass route down the middle the other day. And Malik Hornsby dropped a dime on him for the touchdown. So, um, he still got great, great skills and he wants to be a great player. Miles slusher. Tom, one more, before we get out of here, the, the AP poll came out this week and you're an AP voter. Arkansas is going to play five teams that are ranked in the AP top 25, that's number one, Alabama, number five, Georgia, number six, um, uh, Texas A&M, LSU is ranked 16th, and Texas is ranked 21st. What's your philosophy when you vote on teams in the preseason? And how close did the final top 25 look to the ballot that you submitted? Well, I did not compare them. Pretty busy that day it came out. And I, I go with the fact that I know Alabama is going to have depth. They're going to have their O-line and D-line are going to be stout. I believe Bryce Young will be able to come in and conduct that offense. And I know Clemson is going to be tough and Ohio State. So the four, top four or five are the usual suspects. When you get down to the last few, um, teams like Coastal Carolina that had a really good season, I can't tell you everybody they have coming back, but I do understand it's a lot. So they were in my, in, in my bottom part. Uh, teams like Oklahoma State, Arizona State, you look at the other magazines and, and read through them, and uh, to me, it's a crapshoot. It turns out that I was the only person who voted BYU in the top 25, the only one at all. And so I did a hit with BYU TV earlier this week because they were so happy that somebody voted for BYU. They had a great season last year. They lost Zach Wilson, the quarterback, and a lot of other guys, but and they have a challenging schedule. I think they got Arizona, Utah, and Arizona State early on. So we'll find out whether BYU deserves to be in the top 25. But I like uh, a few weeks in and things starting to sort themselves out a lot better. Go to wholehogsports.com this weekend. We'll have a, a recap of the Razorback scrimmage. We'll also have several more feature stories. Position analysis are still coming out for Tom Murphy and Scotty Bordelon. I'm Matt Jones. Hope you have a great weekend. We'll be back with another podcast on Monday. The preceding has been a production of wholehogsports.com. Look for our latest podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast store. And visit us anytime at wholehogsports.com for the latest news and commentary.